uh, forget it. This meeting is being recorded. I want to welcome everybody to our uh, February meeting of the History of Medicine History Roundtable. Um, we've got uh, uh, most of our people here. Uh, Bill Bremer, as we mentioned, is our treasurer. Uh, Bill, any update on uh, the treasury function? Uh, nothing. Nothing. Uh, I think we have uh, 23 members paid dues so far. Sounds good. Uh, and Chuck Wadey is our adjutant to handle speakers. Chuck, we want to thank you for that uh, responsibility. Um, do any, anybody have uh, any upcoming meetings they would like to tell the group about? Saturday, we're going to Fort Pulaski at Savannah. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Uh, I've been I've been there. It is it's a uh, nice uh, brick old brick fort to visit. So yeah, yeah, yeah uh, Bill. I, I, I obviously I mean the last two months I gave a you know summary of the the Seminole Wars and the Civil War in Florida, yeah. and it, it is refreshing to know that actually now that I'm back down here again this year and I've actually visited a couple sites that we talk about in, in my presentation. And it, it's at least encouraging to me that actually what I was telling people in the presentation is actually halfway accurate. So oh, I thought I, 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 I would relay that information. So. <laughs> and, and you haven't started any new civil wars there or anything like that? Uh, no, uh, not not yet. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's still an interesting state, that's for sure. So. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I met a vendor in Bahamas many, many years ago, Jesus, who said he was 99% honest. <laughs> yeah. isn't, isn't, isn't that the uh, old, old joke about uh, the, the Indians, with the, whether you're a uh, lying Whitefoot or truthful Blackfoot? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, what we've got listed on there is uh, one, one thing to mention is that uh, there's a presentation by Ron White, who is a uh, Lincoln Scholar at the Talmud House in Janesville coming up April 23rd. And now, Bill Bremer, you had also sent around a, a uh, notice about um, the book about the, the uh, World, World War II resistance figure. Oh, Mildred uh, Fish yeah, Arnick is uh, her, I think it's her great, great grandniece, I think, or something like that. I, anyway, she's going to give a lecture at the university uh, in April, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get that on our website. The date is known, but the details are uh, where it's on campus and so forth have not been released yet. So she, She's got an interesting history. She was a... Uh, uh, UW undergraduate student in the 1920s or maybe early 30s met met a German uh, who was here studying as well. They got married and returned to Germany and uh, uh, were, were there when Hitler came to power and um, ended up forming a uh, uh, resistance group or an intelligence group in contact with the uh, Soviets and ultimately was captured and executed by by the Germans so uh, supposedly her her, her uh, uh, warrant for for her death sentence was signed by Adolf Hitler right yeah I think somebody wanted to commute it and Hitler insisted that she be executed so um, uh, any other business for the group to, to share with the group? Uh, with that, we'll uh, move on to our presentation. Uh, Russell Horton is our speaker this evening. Uh, Russell joined the Wisconsin Veterans Museum in 2001 and is currently the reference and outreach archivist. It was an undergraduate degree from the UW Madison and a master's degree in history and library science from UW Milwaukee. He's the author of an award winning article, Unwanted in a White Man's War The Civil War Service of the, of the uh, 
Queen Bay Tribes. Um, tonight he's going to speak on the uh, 32nd Division in the Berlin Crisis. So Russell, the floor is yours. Uh, I, I will mute everyone and then Russell you'll want to unmute yourself. All right. Sound good? Good. There you go. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I am going to share my screen here. There we go. You guys see the um, presentation? Okay. Great. All set to go? Thumbs up? Excellent. So thank you. I want to thank the Madison History Roundtable for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, and I want to thank you all for joining in virtually. I'm doing this from my home. And I want to apologize in advance if you hear my kids arguing about nothing or my dog barking at shadows in the background. I'm going to um, do my best to, or I already instructed them, I guess, to stay quiet. But we'll see how they do. Um, my name is Russ Horton. I'm the reference archivist at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. Um, and I have worked there for over 20 years, and I've helped researchers uh, on topics ranging from the Civil War to the present, always with a Wisconsin angle to it. I've seen a lot of people interested in learning more about the 32nd Division in World War II, um, slightly fewer on the 32nd Division in World War I. Uh, we get some researchers who would like to trace Civil War units to the 32nd Division, and others who want to connect the current National Guard um, to the 32nd Division, but almost no one in my time at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum has expressed an interest in finding out more about the 32nd Division during the Berlin Crisis. Uh, and while I admit that I am a little biased due to my job, that really still surprises me a little bit. Um, in terms of Wisconsin military history, this was a major event that affected more than 10,000 Wisconsinites. Uh, in terms of American and even world military history, this is an event that encapsulates the rising Cold War tensions that put the entire globe in fear of World War III and a nuclear holocaust. Uh, for those reasons, I'm really excited to speak about my topic tonight. I'm going to look at the history. Um, I'm going to do three things, hopefully. I'm going to look at the history of the 32nd Division to give some context about their importance to the state of Wisconsin and their significance in American military history. I'm then going to talk about the context of the Berlin crisis, what led up to it, and what it meant to the people at the time. Um, and then I will explore the activities of the 32nd Division during the Berlin crisis from their call up in the fall of 1961 to their return home in the summer of 1962. And I hope that by the end of this presentation, you'll have a better understanding of the relevance and the importance of what the 32nd Division did in the early 1960s to both Wisconsin military history and world history. Um, all right, so um, to start out with, Wisconsin has a proud military heritage that dates back to the Civil War when local militia companies mustered into federal service. These militia companies had names like the Black Jaegers, the Governor's Guard, the Tiger Rifles, the Eau Claire Eagles, and the Lemon Wire Minutemen. Uh, and not only did the companies have really cool names, uh, but the names also reflected the local nature of the organizations. These uh, groups were based in Wisconsin communities, large and small. And as they were put together into regiments and sent to fight in Virginia, Tennessee, Georgia, and other places, a large part of their strength came from the fact that the men were fighting alongside neighbors and friends and family. These men who fought in famous units like the Iron Brigade and the 8th Wisconsin with Old Abe the War Eagle are the direct descendants of the 32nd Division, as we shall see. The Wisconsin National Guard, or at least the Guard as we would recognize it today, was formed in the 1880s and was an extension of the community-based militia companies from the Civil War. Cities and towns around the state formed National Guard companies composed of local men. They were called into federal service for the first time in 1898 during the Spanish-American War. Roughly 4,000 Wisconsin National Guardsmen served in the conflict, with about half of them deploying to Puerto Rico before the war ended. Um, of the 134 
Wisconsin National Guardsmen who died during the Spanish-American War, only two were killed in action. The other 132 died of disease. In 1916, when a Mexican revolutionary named Pancho Villa raided into the U.S. and killed several U.S. citizens, President Woodrow Wilson called up thousands of National Guardsmen to protect the border while regular army troops went into Mexico after Villa. Again, several thousand Wisconsin National Guardsmen deployed to San Antonio, Texas, where they performed their duty admirably. The following year, 1917, saw the US enter World War I. The Wisconsin National Guard was again called into federal service and sent to Camp MacArthur in Texas to train for action. In the summer of 1917, they were combined with the Michigan National Guard to form the 32nd Division. So that's the, that's the birth of the 32nd Division in the summer of 1917. Um, and, and this lets you see the direct line uh, from the local militia companies of the Civil War to the National Guard companies of the Spanish-American War up to World War I um, in the formation of the 32nd Division. During World War I, the 32nd Division established themselves as one of the finest divisions in the U.S. Army. They fought on five fronts in three major offensives. They were the first American troops to set foot on German soil in May 1918. They fought and defeated 23 German divisions and captured over 2,000 prisoners. They suffered 14,000 casualties during the fighting. As a result of their bravery and brilliance, over 800 officers and enlisted men were decorated, including 245 distinguished service crosses. The units of the 32nd Division were the only National Guard units awarded the Croix de Guerre with palm. They earned the barred red arrow insignia, which signified that they pierced every line that the enemy put before them. And they also earned the nom de guerre uh, Les Terribles by the French. Uh, the 32nd Division was the only American division to be given a nom de guerre by an allied nation during the war. A little over 20 years after that, the 32nd Division was called upon again for service in World War II. Training at Camps Beauregard and Livingston in Louisiana, they were initially slated to return to Europe um, but instead they were sent to the Pacific Theater. There, they were the first American division to fight in offensive action against the Japanese. They participated in six major engagements in four campaigns, including 654 days of combat, more than any other US division during World War II. The men of the Red Arrow Division earned 11 Medals of Honor, 157 Distinguished Service Crosses, 845 silver stars and 11,500 purple hearts. The 32nd Division again proved itself to be one of the most elite units in the U.S. Army. By 1960, the 32nd Division had become solely a Wisconsin organization. The Michigan National Guard had moved out uh, and they were considered a high priority National Guard unit. It had an authorized strength of over 10,000 and an officer corps full of experienced World War II and Korean War veterans. It is here in 1961 that I'm going to step away from the 32nd Division to look at the situation in Germany and the context of the Berlin crisis. As I mentioned, I've worked at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum for 20 years and in that time, I've been part of many conversations about the significant events in American military history, as well as in Wisconsin military history. The 32nd Division is often mentioned, but always in the context of World War I and World War II. Their activation during the Berlin crisis is almost never mentioned. And when I bring it up, it is often met with dismissive comments like they didn't even deploy overseas or they didn't see any combat. And to be fair, I've spoken with many veterans of this event and they themselves downplay it. But I think if you look at the context of the Berlin crisis, it can help greatly to understand the seriousness of the situation and what these men um, thought and even expected to be getting involved in. The context 
of the global situation in 1961 stretches all the way back to World War II. The war in Europe ended on May 8, 1945, and two months later, the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union held the Potsdam Conference, which sought to decide how to handle post-war Germany. It was here that the Allied powers broke Germany up into four sectors, controlled by the Americans, British, French, and Soviets, respectively. The capital city of Berlin, which fell within the Soviet sector, was also split into four sectors. A governing body called the Allied Control Council was formed to administer the occupation zones in Germany. Four days after the Potsdam Conference ended, the United States dropped a nuclear bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima and a second on Nagasaki three days later. This quickly brought an end to the war in the Pacific, and it also established the United States as the only country in the world with functional nuclear weapons. So in August 1945, on the surface at least, world affairs seemed in order. World War II was over, a coalition of powerful nations had broken the power of Germany and divided it into sectors with a plan to move toward reunification, and the United States was the sole possessor of nuclear weapons. Things seemed, if not peaceful, at least stable. But then, as the saying goes, things fall apart. Beneath the surface, even before the Potsdam Conference, distrust and animosity was already brewing among the big three allies of the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union. Each country had questions about the intentions of the others, um, with issues of defense, expansion, economics, and politics all coming into play. This came to a head in March 1948, when the Soviet representative on the Allied Control Council stormed out and never returned. In June 1948, the first major flare-up of the Cold War occurred in Berlin. The Soviet Union effectively cut off all ground and water transport into West Berlin, which kept the Western nations from being able to send supplies to the German citizens there. The Soviets hoped that this would force West Berliners to rely on Soviet supplies and the Soviet economy effectively severing their ties with the United States, Great Britain, and France. This was a drastic move by the Soviets and their Western allies, excuse me, the Western allies were left with three options. They could back down, they could forcibly enter West Berlin by ground and risk World War III, or they could find another way to supply the people and occupation forces in West Berlin. An oversight in the negotiations at Potsdam had failed to guarantee land and water routes into West Berlin. However, the agreement did protect air routes into the city. And thus, working with the British, the Americans began the Berlin airlift. The airlift operation was a risky move, as it, in essence, dared the Soviets to stop it, which likely would have led to war. Using C-47s and C-54s, Food supplies and coal were flown into West Berlin, keeping both German citizens and Allied occupation troops fed and supplied. This, this operation was so effective that the Soviets, who were humiliated, dropped the, blo the blockade in May 1949. The Berlin airlift transported 2 million tons of supplies to West Berlin, and at its height, an airplane reached the city every 30 seconds. Discussed briefly like this, it comes off as a feel-good feel tale of American ingenuity, which it is, um, but it was also the first face-off of the Cold War and could easily have led to another world war. Three months later, the nascent Cold War became much more frightening. In August 1949, the Soviet Union successfully tested a nuclear bomb. This meant that the fear of another world war now had the added element of it being a nuclear war. Over the next few years, three other nations developed nuclear weapons, and the US and Soviet Union produced hydrogen bombs and intercontinental ballistic missiles. A new concept was introduced called mutual assured destruction whereby any nuclear war would result in the complete destruction of both warring countries. While it was thought 
that mutual, mutual assured destruction was in itself a deterrent to nuclear war that didn't stop the American public from building bomb shelters, having bomb drills, and taking other measures in preparation for a nuclear war. 1949 also saw the creation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, with the United States, Great Britain, France, and Canada among the more prominent members. NATO members agreed to come to the defense of any member nation that fell under attack, a clear reaction to the rising power of the Soviet Union. The stakes were rising. The very next year, 1950, North Korean forces invaded South Korea, the beginning of the Korean War. The United States participated as part of the United Nations forces to support the South Koreans. While the Soviet Union did not actively participate, they did contribute weapons and supplies to the North Koreans. The Korean War lasted three years, cost hundreds of thousands of lives, and saw the United States strongly consider the use of nuclear weapons. While not the apocalyptic mutual assured destruction that so many had feared, this certainly seemed like a step in that direction. In 1955, the Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc countries formed the Warsaw, Warsaw Pact to counter NATO. And under the aggressive leadership of Khrushchev, the possibility of nuclear war seemed nearer. This Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, between capitalism and communism, could be seen affecting events all over the world. Proxy conflicts flared up in South America, Africa, and the Middle East. But the real point of contention seemed to come back again and again to Germany. After another unsuccessful attempt in 1958 to force the Allies out of West Berlin, the Soviet Union threatened to end Allied access to the city in 1961. President Kennedy responded in July 1961 by famously stating, quote, we seek peace, but we shall not surrender, end quote. He asked Congress for an additional $3 billion of military spending, increased the total authorized strength of the army by almost 200,000 soldiers, doubled the draft calls, and increased infrastructure in the country, such as fallout shelters, air raid warnings, and fallout detection systems. The response to a threat that, to be honest, had been made before shows the severity of the situation. The United States was gearing up for war, and subsequent events only heightened that impression. One of the big reasons the Soviets wanted the Allies out of West Berlin was a problem of emigration. Between the end of World War II and 1961, three and a half million East German citizens, a full 20% of their population, fled the country, many through West Berlin. These emigrants included many young, highly educated professionals, and the loss of so many affected the economy of East Germany. The Soviets and East German government wanted to end this quickly. So in August 1961, they shut down the border between East and West Berlin and began building the Berlin Wall. The Soviet army maintained a presence at the wall to discourage any interference, and their presence led to a confrontation called Checkpoint Charlie, where American and Soviet tanks faced off about 100 yards apart for a week. To be honest, I don't think the level of tension in the world in August 1961 can be exaggerated. Less than two decades had passed since the end of World War II, and it was less than a decade after the Korean War had ended. So both the memory and the fear of war were very fresh all around the world. There was the threat of nuclear annihilation, with both the US and Soviets having nuclear weapons. And with all of the tension brewing in Germany and Berlin in particular, it seemed a very real possibility that war was coming and a nuclear war at that. And it was into this situation that the 32nd Division would bravely march. At the end of August 1961, President Kennedy responded to the Soviet moves by ordering 148,000 guardsmen and reservists to begin combat readiness training. This was not a full activation, but it was a warning that such a call might be coming soon. The 32nd Division, 
uh, as I mentioned, one of the National Guard's high prior priority units was included in this call. The Red Arrow Division was already near its authorized strength of just over 10,000. They had won numerous awards during their annual summer training, and they had an experienced officer corps, which, as I mentioned, had World War II and Korean War veterans. In September 1961, the 32nd Division was activated and troops ordered to report to their armories on October 15th for up to one year of service. About a week later, an advance party flew out to Fort Lewis in Washington State to prepare the barracks, which hadn't been used since World War II. Um, they were to prepare for the full division's arrival within weeks. After a weekend furlough, in which many guardsmen celebrated an early Thanksgiving with their families, the 32nd Division traveled by train, plane, and automobile 1,600 miles to Fort Lewis, which is near Tacoma, Washington. The vast majority of the division reported at Fort Lewis by October 28th, less than two weeks after activation. Uh, and I want to show you a slide that has the uh, makeup of the 32nd Division at this time. For any of you who've studied the 32nd Division in World War II or World War I, you can see that it, it's a little different looking. Um, whereas it used to have four infantry regiments, it's down to two now with the Michigan leaving. Um, there's the addition of uh, tank uh, forces as well as an aviation company. And again, this was roughly 10,000 uh, men. Okay, so conditions at Fort Lewis were less than ideal to say the least. Uh, I already mentioned that the barracks hadn't been used since World War II. They lacked such modern amenities as hot water and furnaces. The barracks were also fairly cramped, especially when about 4,000 Army reservists arrived to fill in the division's ranks. To top it all off, supplies and equipment were slow to arrive due to some differences in the regular Army and National Guard supply systems. All of this added up to some unhappy members of the 32nd Division. A number of Red Arrow men communicated their unhappiness with the conditions to their state representatives. Less than a month after the men had arrived at Fort Lewis, Congressman Alvin Okonski, who represented Northwestern Wisconsin, visited the men, observed conditions at Fort Lewis, and called for a federal investigation. Senator William Proxmeyer also visited the men in late November with Congressman Melvin Laird and others stopping out in early December. All of this attention led to led some to view the 32nd Division as a crybaby division. A member of the 32nd Division was quoted in the Milwaukee Journal as saying, it's a soldier's prerogative to gripe, but there's a difference between griping and crying. These issues uh, fell by the wayside as the pace of training picked up. While the different types of units participated in different types of training, uh, I wanted to give an example of how the men um, in the two different infantry regiments trained. Uh, the first three weeks they were at Fort Lewis uh, was spent with individual training like physical fitness, marksmanship, and more. In November and December 1961, they worked on squad and platoon level training, getting used to operating in small groups. January 1962 saw them engaging in larger group uh, company training, where they worked on um, attacks and withdrawals, night training, defensive maneuvers, and more. Final training and testing occurred in the week of January, the last week of January. Outside of the infantry regiments, uh, some notable training also occurred. On February 7th, 1962 at Fort Lewis, Battery B of the 121st Artillery became the first National Guard unit to fire the Honest John hit while on active duty. The Honest John 
was a 27 foot long two ton rocket that was the army's first nuclear capable surface to surface rocket. And it was seen as, as a, a big honor and accomplishment for the 32nd division to be able to use them. One of the main goals of the 32nd division call up uh, was to achieve strategic army corps or STRAC designation. STRAC was developed as an answer to the threat of limited wars around the world, largely in reaction to Soviet actions. STRAC consisted of eight divisions that would be armed with the newest weapons and maintain instant combat readiness and the ability to quickly respond to threats anywhere in the world, either taking on the threat directly or reinforcing American forces who were already there. On February 15, 1962, the 32nd Division was officially designated as a STRAC division, accomplishing uh, the mission of their call-up. They were assigned to STRAC 2, which meant that they would be in the second line of STRAC to be called in an emergency. Achieving STRAC designation was an incredible accomplishment for the 32nd Division, and it reflected well on the training that they had maintained in Wisconsin in the years following World War II. Following STRAC designation came some group exercises. The 32nd Division had maneuvered as a division since World War II, so attention was given to large-scale exercises. Uh, the Red Arrow men engaged in three significant exercises during their time at Fort Lewis. The first uh, large-scale exercise in which components of the 32nd Division participated was called Exercise Bristlecone. It took place at Fort Irwin in California, uh, which is near Death Valley, in early March 1962. It involved uh, parts of the division, but not the entire 32nd Division. It was designed to train particip participants in techniques of desert operations and to provide joint training in tactical air operations. Um, as you can see from these slides, our library has handbooks and other documents that relate to this exercise. Um, so if anyone is interested in learning more about uh, any of these exercises that I'm going to be talking about, please feel free to reach out to the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. We do have quite a few um, primary sources for them. Uh, the biggest training exercise during this activation involved uh, the entire division and it was the largest military exercise in the U.S. since World War II. And also the first time that the 32nd Division has had operated as a whole since that conflict. Operation Mesa Drive took place at the Yakima Firing Center in May 1962. The 32nd Division, along with part of the 4th Infantry Division, cooperated with several Air Force units throughout. The purpose of the exercise was to give the men experience and training in coordinated attacks, counterattacks, defensive actions, withdrawals, and other maneuvers. Men were able to use the training that they had been receiving previously in biological, chemical, and nuclear weapons attacks, guerrilla warfare, psychological warfare, and radio communication. This was the 32nd Division's chance to show that their training had paid off and that they were prepared for a call to action. And again, we have um, numerous documents relating to exercise Mesa Drive, including the after action report. Um, it, it's, I think it's kind of interesting stuff if you're into that uh, level of detail on these. One of the really interesting things that I found in our collection relating to Mesa Drive is the literature pertaining to um, the, the perceived enemy of all of this, which was portrayed by members of the 4th Infantry Division. Um, you can see here they called themselves aggressor. And just the, the level of detail that were put into creating a distinct uniform, rank insignia, um, and everything for these, these opponents that the 32nd Division faced during this exercise are really incredible. Um, there were observers and officials who watched over the exercise to be sure things were 
were done correctly and fairly. Um, interesting, interesting stuff. Toward the end of the division's activation period, uh, part of the 32nd division uh, took part in a unique operation known as Exercise Sherwood Forest. The first battle group of the 128th Infantry Regiment had been receiving special training in counter guerrilla operations. Uh, some sources that I found suggest that they were the first US Army unit to receive such training. Taking the name Task Force Robin Hood, these Red Arrow men squared off against special forces units in the Olympic National Forest in Washington, um, and they held their own. Following this flurry of activity, things quieted down a little in Fort Lewis. Again, this is now um, May of 1962. But I do want to highlight two interesting events from this time that are a little bit on the lighter side. Um, and the first involves a lion. And I literally mean a lion. This is not an exaggeration. Uh, I'm still digging into this a little to find all of the details. But while they were at Fort Lewis, men in the 132nd Signal Battalion purchased a lion cub from a Tacoma, Washington pet shop. I have never been at a pet shop that had lions, but apparently in 1962 or 1961, uh, there were some pet shops that had lions. They named him Leaky, Leaky, Leaky the Lion, uh, and they made him an official, unofficial mascot of the division. Now I've talked to men who were part of this call up in the 32nd division, and many of them never heard of Leaky. So I'm not sure how widely he circulated amongst the division or if he was mostly kept with the signal battalion, but um, he, he definitely was there as you can see from this picture. Uh, I've heard some rumors that all of Leaky's teeth had been removed as a safety precaution, but I haven't confirmed that yet. Uh, I've also heard that men brought Leaky back to Wisconsin with them and even possibly donated him to the, the Henry Vilas Zoo in Madison. Um, and again, I haven't confirmed this yet. I'm, I'm in the process of digging, um, but it's a, it's a pretty interesting story. Nonetheless, you can see Leakey's grown a little bit in this photo of him in a Jeep. I've heard of military units adopting dogs, cats, small birds, and even monkeys as mascots. Uh, in the Civil War, there were Wisconsin units who had a bald eagle, a black bear and even a badger as mascots, but I've never heard of a lion as a mascot. It just blows my mind um, when I see it. The other fun story um, from this period involves football and the Green Bay Packers. Uh, the Berlin crisis also affected our beloved green and gold. Three star players were members of the Army Reserves and were called up in the fall of 1961. Boyd Dowler, Paul Horning, and Ray Nitschke, names you might recognize if you're Packer fans. Um, while Horning was sent to Fort Riley in Kansas, Dowler and Nitschke were sent to Fort Lewis to help fill out the ranks of the 32nd Division. Uh, Nitschke was assigned to the Quartermaster Company and Dowler to the 32nd Division Artillery. It looked like these three key players um, would have to miss the final nine games of the season and the playoffs, which was a major blow to the Packers who had lost to the Eagles in the NFL championship game the season before. Two Wisconsin state legislators pushed to get deferments for the Packer players, but the army refused. In the end, uh, coach Vince Lombardi made a deal with the 32nd division officers Dowler and Nitschke received permission to fly home each Friday evening um, so that they could play on Sunday, but they had to be back at Fort Lewis by Monday morning uh, in time for uh, Reveille. In exchange for this concession, Lombardi and the Packers agreed to send game film for each of their games to Fort Lewis for the viewing pleasure and entertainment of the men. This arrangement benefited all parties involved as the men of the 32nd division enjoyed the game film, as well as serving alongside two of their sports heroes. The Packers in turn 
enjoyed an 11 and three season and went on to defeat the New York Giants in the NFL championship game 31 to nothing on December 31st, 1961. I found that there were other professional athletes who served with the 32nd division at Fort Lewis during this time. Uh, the most well-known of the others that I had found is uh, Elgin Baylor, the famous basketball player who was with the Lakers. Uh, he also worked a deal where he could um, play games on the weekends, although not during the week. Um, so he only played about half the games of that NBA season. Um, there were also players from the Minnesota Vikings and Detroit Lions in the NFL, uh, in the Los Angeles Angels and the New York Yankees um, in Major League Baseball. So on July 25th, 1962, an advanced detachment from the 32nd Division returned to Wisconsin to begin preparing the various National Guard armories for the return of 10,000 guardsmen. About a week later, on August 1st, 1962, the 32nd Division left Fort Lewis, arriving in Wisconsin eight days later. On August 10th, 1962, 10 months after being activated, the 32nd Division was officially released from federal service. President Kennedy sent a personal message to the men of the division, stating, quote, from the time when it was first alerted for duty in September 1961, the Red Arrow Division has achieved an exemplary record, one in which you may take great pride. In attaining the high state of combat effectiveness, the division has lived up to its excellent reputation and in so doing has added materially to the readiness of our forces. When the free world needed increased military strength to meet its challenges, you responded. Having met the emergency and accomplished your mission, you can return to your civilian pursuits with pride in your hearts." End quote. The men did that, returning to Wisconsin uh, throughout August to resume their lives as civilian soldiers. This call-up proved to be the last hurrah for the 32nd Division. Five years later, in 1967, the division was inactivated and redesignated as a separate infantry brigade. The battle to maintain the 32nd designation, as well as the Red Arrow insignia, is another story for another time. Um, today, as you probably know, the Wisconsin National Guard continues to proudly wear the Red Arrow and carry on the tradition um, of the 32nd Division. And that is um, what I have for the presentation today on the 32nd Division in the Berlin Crisis. I want to thank you guys for all listening and um, happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, thank you, Russell. Uh, as you were talking, one of the things I uh, took a quick look at is you talked about the rising Cold War tensions and um, the Berlin Crisis happened in August of 61. I looked up in the Cuban Missile Crisis happened in April of 61, and then in October of 61 was the Cuban Missile Crisis, so. Yeah, I really, um, I think in retrospect, it's easy to look at this event, and, and like I said, even the veterans themselves today will talk about like, wow, we didn't really do anything, but I think they fully expected to, to be deployed somewhere. Um, during this activation or, or to um, soon be deployed somewhere. So this was, it was a big deal. I would remind, Russell, go ahead. Do you wanna go, do you, I was just gonna ask real quick, do you um, have any idea of where they might have deployed to in Germany? I mean, I, I think the thought was probably Berlin uh, with the wall being built. That was kind of the, um, they were the going in camel's back. Okay. But, but really, like, as I said, with their training, they were, the, the STRAC designation was really to be prepared to deploy just about anywhere on, on quick notice, um, whether that would have been, you know, in Africa or Asia or, or somewhere else where, where there were tensions flaring, like they were, they were prepared to deploy on, on very short notice um, anywhere in the world. Um, I, I have not a question, but a comment. Um, I dated a young woman in high school 
who, when she was a little girl, moved with their family to, to the Fort Lewis area while their father was deployed there. Um, he was in a transportation company, I believe, uh, based out of Black River Falls. And uh, um, so uh, I remember seeing pictures of the time there, um, 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 both of Mr. Calhoun, who was, he was a non-commissioned officer, uh, and then and then with the with their children. So, yeah, interesting stuff. I uh, actually uh, a few years ago got to go to a wedding out in Seattle, um, and I made a point to drive down to Fort Lewis, which is still an active military base. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't able to get as close as I'd hoped <laughs> because of that fact, <laughs> but it was neat to neat to kind of be in that yeah. area and see it and think yeah. about what, what those guys have been doing there 50 years ago. Yeah. Was there a precipitating event that caused uh, basically in August of September 62 to basically disassemble and, and allow the, the 32nd to go back home? Um, I don't know if there was a precipitating event so much as just that they had accomplished what they had been intended to, to do. They achieved the SRAC. Um, designation. They were able to successfully carry out the, the full divisional exercise at Mesa Drive um, and a couple of other exercises as well. I think they just, they had, they had done what, what they could do there. Um, yeah. And there was, wasn't a point in really keeping them there um, any longer. Okay. I, I found it interesting you were talking about the uh, um, World War II and Korean uh, era veterans that were in the division. And I know when we came to Vietnam, one, one of the weaknesses I've read in a couple histories was that the, the army had assumed that as they ramped up for Vietnam, that they would get NCOs and um, lieutenants and captains from the reserves and National Guard, but Johnson, for political reasons, refused to allow the reserves and National Guard to be called up to serve in Vietnam. So we ended up with uh, relatively inexperienced NCOs and uh, uh, frontline officers in Vietnam. Yeah, I think that's a good observation. Um... And actually, I was looking through um, basically the 32nd Division put out like a yearbook. Um, I have it right here uh, that talks about what they did and gives uh, this is where I got a lot of the pictures from. It has biographies of the officers and pictures of all the men. And you know, reading about the, the officers, the commanding officer was Herbert Smith, who was a highly decorated World War II veteran. Um, the two um, COs of the infantry regiments were, again, highly decorated World War II veterans. Um, yeah, it's exactly the opposite of what you're talking about in Vietnam. These, these were experienced officers who knew what they were doing and had incredible um, relevant experience. Yeah. Other questions or comments for Russell? Uh, just one. This actually has to do with uh, quite a bit earlier than that, but I, I picked up a new book that I've been reading called Eight Days in May, and it's the eight days after Hitler killed himself. And while there's been a lot of things written about that, um, this is it, it's a different twist on it that uh, gets into some of the civilian and military actions that were taking place all around Germany. It's a very interesting book by Volker Ulrich. Thanks, Steve. Ed Street. Hello. Go ahead. Now you're on mute. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Ed, three quick comments. Um, two minor and one I find really interesting. Um, a number of my high school classmates were in the guard and got sent out to Fort Lewis at that time. And at our last 60 some class reunion, I found out 
that the one guy who was in the guard uh, was actually the youngest member in our class. And he was, uh, it was two weeks before his 18th birthday when the, when the guard got called up and there was some rule that said you couldn't send anybody under 18. So the rest of them got sent out to Fort Lewis and two weeks later he got married instead because they, <laughs> they couldn't send them. The other was um, my basketball coach was in the guard and got sent to Fort Lewis and got was made the basketball coach of the, the team. And they ended up with like a 44 win, five loss record, something like that. But the, the most important one is to go way back. 1972, I was in, on an exchange program in France. And on Memorial Day, we got taken to a children's hospital. And it was a chateau that the great grandmother was from Mississippi. So in World War I, the family gave the chateau to the US Army to use as a hospital. Then they took it back after the war. Then in World War II, they gave the chateau to the army again. And then after the war, they left it in the hands of the army who gave it to France for a children's hospital. So since it's Memorial Day, they have a cenotaph there, which uh, listed the names of all the World War I soldiers who had died at that hospital. And they gave me the wreath to go up and put on a cenotaph. And as I'm putting it down, I look up and the top name was a soldier from Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. Um, I kind of freaked out. Well, um, relating to your comment on the basketball coach, uh, the, the yearbook that I just held up before talks about recreational activities at Fort Lewis, and they did have a very active um, sport uh, series with basketball and football and boxing and, and all that sort of stuff. And like I said, there were professional athletes in the, in the division. So yeah, that, that's really interesting. I understand the, the, 32nd Division uh, has a museum at the Army base at Vogt, Vogt Field. Have you ever been there, Russ? Yeah, um, actually, for a while we we operated it. Uh, the the okay. Veterans Museum operated it. it it's um, I'm not a hundred percent sure it's still going. Um, it had closed for a little while. It might be open again. The best because of COVID, because of COVID, or or no, just just because of staffing or whatever. Yeah, I think somewhat staffing and somewhat um, uh, attendance and, and things. You know. Um, oh, okay. And we operated. It, I think it was only open nine months a year. It was pretty limited hours. I mean, you know, it's an active military installation. So again, access to it is getting to it is not, a different story. Not the easiest. <laughs> so yeah, but yeah. Uh, certainly there there has been and there might be honestly i don't know um but yeah uh there there might be a, a museum still at, at both field um uh, i got that information from our our speaker who for for next month um ward Zizeski, who is oh, sure. with, yeah. uh, if you know uh, ward think, yeah 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 so he's our speaker and he would know uh, better than me <laughs> yeah <laughs> and he didn't say anything about being closed. So he, he just said the 32nd has a, a museum there. Now, whether it's open because of COVID or, or not, or whether just staffing or whatever. But anyway, he said that there, that some of the mementos, in other words, from the 32nd are, are there. So, uh, Russell, we want to thank you for speaking tonight. Thanks. It's been a thank pleasure. Thank you for a great presentation. Uh, next month, we will meet on uh, March 10th. As Bill Bermo is mentioning, we have a speaker uh, who will talk about the 101st uh, Division uh, Between the Wars. And uh, looking forward to that. 
Um, we don't have it on the uh, agenda that went out, but we also have a uh, speaker scheduled for April uh, who will talk about the uh, nefarious Dodge Brothers in the uh, Mississippi Valley uh, prior to them uh, coming to Wisconsin. So uh, we look forward to uh, being with you next month. Hey, Thanks Bill, do you want to mention anything about meeting in person, potentially? Oh, yes. Thanks, Rich. Um, the, the Dane County uh, indoor mask, mask mandate is scheduled to expire at the end of this month. Um, my, my fearless prediction is they're, they're going to uh, uh, let it end and not put a new one on. If that's the case, we're going to try to meet uh, in person next month uh, at the Hop House. So we want, as event expire, we'll let you know. For, for those of you who have not returned yet from Florida, uh, we're also planning on uh, recording that meeting and we'll send a link out uh, a day or two after the meeting. Great. <laughs> I, I think, Bill, maybe you also want to mention that it, it, we had to make these uh, different uh, meeting locations because of uh, challenges that the Radisson Hotel is no longer serving meals. <laughs> and uh, so that's why we had to do something different. So uh, the meal situation will be a little bit different. It'll be you'll actually order off the menu. Sounds good. We look forward to seeing you hopefully in person next month. Take care. We hope so. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you, Russ. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bye, Russ. Thanks, Russ. Yep. Thank you.